Let's start with a brief recap on behavior trees. Last uh, module we saw an alternative to finite state machines. It's an augmentation of that concept. And it comes with the same kind of nodes that you are used to where program execution is kind of encapsulated, which are these uh, nodes here where the robot actually does stuff like sensing or actuation. But now we have uh, some new symbols that help us group the actions that the robot does. And in particular, we have the selector node and the sequence node. The selector node executes its children until the first one succeeds. So you can use it to test something like here to sense if the pack is already in the gripper. And if it's not, only then I execute the sequence get pack. And the sequence executes all of its nodes until one of them fails and then it fails itself or it succeeds when they all succeed. The big advantage of behavior trees is that you have to formulate each action as having a bimodal outcome. They can either succeed or fail and in the middle they are running. This makes them much easier to be composed into more complex scenarios because other people do not have to think about what actually happens and uh, what all the you know thresholds or all sorts of things are that you would put on the state transitions in a finite state machine in a behavior tree you know that each of these nodes will either succeed or not which forces you to think about your behaviors in a certain way and there's another concept that is important here you can either have behavior trees that execute each node until the action is done but you can also tick them uh, that is you call a command tick for let's say 100 milliseconds or one second or robot step and robots and that will tick any of these nodes the current node or the last node that the robot or the behavior tree has been in for example the first tick for open gripper might initialize that node and start the motion of the gripper fingers then uh, subsequent calls to tick will check whether the gripper is already open and finally once the gripper is open the node will uh, yield success and the execution will move on to the next leaf there are some additional concepts that you will need when working with behavior trees the first one is the parallel node this one executes all its all of its leaves in or all of its children in parallel. You can do stuff like perception and navigation, for example, at the same time, or in this case, we do perception and manipulation uh, for pack and hole assembly. We do have a concept of blackboards, which are global variables in behavior trees, and very often these libraries come with the blackboard abstraction which allows you to read and write and control who can access a variable when. And finally, we have a concept called decorators, which you can use to change how nodes are executed. And in this case, I have an example here, which is the repeat decorator, which will just keep repeating uh, its children or its child in this case, and basically create a while true loop but you might also have a decorator like invert, which changes the outcome of a behavior and many more. Uh, here it really depends on what kind of library you choose. And these libraries usually try to put you into some kind of framework. Now, um, it's important to note the behavior tree idea is the state of the art tool for AI programming in games uh, like ego shooters, but also, you know, strategy uh, games where uh, agents um, execute complex behaviors. And you see them more and more even in industrial robots where behavior trees are the chosen framework for graphical programming interfaces. To implement BTs, you can use a behavior, you can use a class uh, that you create yourself or you can use a library. In this case, I have the PyTree library here and you see how the tree is composed by adding children to other nodes like the sequence node here. You have the opportunity to render the tree and get a graphical representation. And then you have to implement the behaviors by overriding 
certain methods of a class and in this case the PyTrees library has all sorts of methods like setup, initialize, update and then finally terminate that are called at different uh, stations in the life cycle of a behavior tree. For that uh, I recommend going through the examples on Coursera, trying out to program your own class abstraction and then you will see uh, why these things are important. We'll now move on to the next topic, ARM um, kinematics, which you will need for the final project. And in this case, you will work with the Tiago robot, which has an ARM. And the problem that you will face is how to compute the joint angles of the robot for the gripper to move to a certain position and grasp an object. So in this case, I have this yellow block here and I want to grasp it. And the question is, how do I set all these joint angles so that the robot arm will end up there? There's a related problem to this. Once I know which joint angles I want, the arm doesn't move there instantaneously. But you also have to program something like a trajectory controller. And for that, I want to recall, when you implement a trajectory control for the mobile robot, we were working in Cartesian space and with waypoints in Cartesian space and there you would sense the position the robot is at and wait with your execution until the robot has arrived at a desired pose. When you do this with the arm, you do the same thing, except you sense the joint angles and then wait until all of the joints are at the desired angle. For this, you don't have only the motors, but you also have sensors, and in this case, all motors have encoders that you can get uh, in WeBots. And in this case, I show you the encoders for the left and the right gripper in the fingers. So you can um, write a controller that waits until the fingers uh, have arrived at a certain position. And you can do the same for all of the robot's joints. When you look uh, closer at the Tiago robot, you will see that it has quite a lot of joints. It has seven DOF in its arm, and it then has this torso lift joint, and that you can use to dramatically simplify the inverse kinematics problem by setting the robot arm to a fixed uh, height, and then use the lift joint to move up and down. If you want to better understand how these sensors work, I recommend to go into WeBots and click on Show Robot Window, when you click on the robot and then um, use the context sim menu item uh, show robot window that opens a browser where you can see all the different motors as well as the sensors and once the robot is running in WeBots you can use the mouse to slide the values and see how the arm actually moves. For this I recommend to actually turn the wheels off so that the robot doesn't move while you do that and put it in a location where you can experiment with it and then you can easily see what the different uh, joints do and what their limitations are. You can also download the URDF file from WeBots by right-clicking on the robot and then visualize this kind of universal robot descriptor file using online tools like the one you see here. This is a JavaScript tool that loads the URDF into a browser and you do see all of the joints that it has and you can use sliders to see how they would move. To the right you see again uh, an excerpt of a URDF file and what you can see you have visual things that are for visualization um, and you have collision nodes that uh, show how the robot internally manages uh, collision avoidance for example when you load it into PyBullet and in this case, you can see that the link is made from different cylinders that have different radii and lengths and different positions and are connected with each other to form the link. So in practice, you will not need to actually solve this problem analytically for all of the degrees of freedom for of the robot, but you might want to teach the robot by demonstration certain poses that you like for example, this one you can easily figure out by manually moving the robot into this uh, conformation. Then you save the joint values that you need for this and uh, write a trajectory controller that moves the robot arm into this pose. 
You can do the same thing for a stowing position and um, also for grasping positions. Now, in this case, uh, you can go a little further and say, I do like this position here. And now it would be nice if I could just move the end effector back and forth. Now, if you look at the specific kinematics of this scenario, you will find that the arm forms a triangle in which all of the angles always have to have 180 degrees. And you can also see that due to the symmetry, the yellow angles are always the same. So you can essentially control the back and forth motion of this configuration by changing the green angle. And then you can easily calculate the other two so to make a smooth motion back and forth. So this is a very basic way of doing the IK of a complex mechanism just for uh, the use case that you have in mind, which is grasping this um, block. You can also augment this uh, one step further by uh, thinking about uh, how to move the other joint here, which allows you to move this arm left and right. So you can approach the object and then move the um, arm so that it aligns with the cube and then use this IK solver to do a back and forth motion. And so you don't have to do all of these things at once to get an elegant controller. You can now even go one step further and um, fully solve the inverse kinematics of this reduced um, two degrees of freedom arm. And in this case, I assume that I can always set this um, end effector joint value to a constant uh, degree that follows um, this one here. And so I can focus on these two um, angles, which I call alpha and beta. And when you think about this formally, you do have uh, a nonlinear mapping between the two dimensional joint space alpha better to the three dimensional x, y and tether um, orientation or pose of the end effector. Now I can write down the equations and look at the individual joints. So I start with the first link and I call this position here x1, y1. I know the length of this link and I know the angle that I can set um, using the controller. So I can write down an equation for the position of this joint x1 and y1 by simply solving the trigonometry here. So this point is L1 times cosine of alpha and the y coordinate is L1 times sine of alpha. I can now go to the next link from here and what I do is I look at again L2 and I see that the angle now is alpha plus beta. So I have L2 times cosine of alpha plus beta to get to x2. And I do the same for y2, which is alpha plus beta times sine. And now I can do a quick sanity check and actually look at the cosine. And as you see, once you go above 90 degrees, the cosine becomes negative. So these angles that are larger than 90 degrees will actually lead to a negative um, outcome. So I will subtract the uh, value here from x1. So I go first to the right and then I go back to the left. So this totally makes sense. Um, the same uh, is the case for sine, which remains positive uh, once you go above uh, 90 degrees. And so um, this will also work out and you will add to y1. I can now write down the complete solution for x, y, and tether. Now um, I just add these two equations together and plug in the solutions here. Um, now for tether, this is just the sum of alpha and beta. And I also know how I have to turn this third degree in order to align it with the y coordinate. But more to this later. Now I can also write down a transformation matrix for this whole uh, transformation from the base link, which I call zero, to the second link. And I write this down as zero to two, a transformation from zero to two. And in this case, I plug in the translation that we just computed here to the right. But I also have to plug in the rotation around the z-axis. 
and in this case I rotate around the z-axis by alpha plus better so I plug in my cosine of alpha plus better and here my minus sine of alpha plus better as we have done in the past. Now it's worthwhile to think about this uh, real quick um, how to compute this uh, in a different way. I could also first start co computing the transformation from 0 to 1 in that case, I would have only these two components as my translation, and I would only have a translation around, or a rotation, sorry, around alpha here. Uh, and I have here cosine of alpha, minus sine of alpha, sine of alpha, and cosine of alpha. And then I could write down the transformation from 1 to 2, which again has a rotation, but this time around better. And I have another translation. Um, which is this one here, which will be added here. Now, as you might remember, in order to get the translation from 0 to 2, I can multiply the two transformations from 0 to 1 and from 1 to 0, and I will get exactly this. I leave this as an exercise to you, but we will also uh, get back to this, this lecture later. Now the inverse kinematics is what I'm actually interested in and in this case I have to somehow find a way to invert my nonlinear mapping from a Cartesian pose that I want to get at to compute the joint angles that I need. Now in this case I would go from a three-dimensional space to a two-dimensional uh, joint space and in order to do this I can do this the hard way and start looking at this individually. But as you can see, even looking at the first link, you will run into the first problem because this uh, equation has two solutions when you invert it. One is the positive angle alpha, the other is the negative angle alpha, which of course doesn't make sense because I uh, will not reach up here. So I have to limit myself to solutions which will give me a positive y solution and managing this um, is complicated and it will get downhill from here as you can imagine. Now there's a simpler approach. I do know that my uh, frame uh, at link 2 can be expressed with a transformation matrix that will look like this. There will be a translation and there will be a rotation around Terra and at the same time I know that my transformation matrix will look like that. So I have a chance to equate all of the individual components here and in this first case I see that tether must be alpha plus better and then I can go and set these individual uh, equations here um, and equate them with x and this one with y. I can then solve them for cosine of alpha and sine of alpha and I will find that I can compute my angle alpha simply from the x and the y position that I want to get at. Now you might ask, well, what about this angle tethered here that I don't know? And here the trick is to say I always want this angle to be 90 degrees. I want my n effector to point always in the same direction. And so I can assume this to be a given and basically add a constraint to the system which allows me to solve my um, equation system which only has two degrees of freedom which are the two uh, joint angles alpha and better but has three um, dimensions in Cartesian space. So I constrain one of those dimensions and then my equation system becomes tractable. All right. There is a better way to do all of this and this is a very formal way to treating the robot kinematics and I came up with this uh, very ugly drawing which um, tries to depict two, um, let's call them universal robotic joints that have all the possible um, complications that a robotic joint can have. In practice most robotic joints have only one or two of them and we will see this later but in this case I have this joint that can rotate around this axis and then it does some weird twist to get another axis and what I have written down here are all sorts of parameters to 
parameterize those translations from here to there. I can go over to this axis and the distance from this axis to that axis and so on. So this is called the Denovit Hartenberg parameters um, and it consists of four parameters and the basic idea is to put a coordinate system at every joint. So here I have three coordinate systems. Um, I index them with i minus one, which is this one. So I have x, y, and z minus i minus one. I have x, y, and z uh, of i here, which is left out. And then I have x, y, and z of i plus one, which is written here. Now I can put down parameters and other dimensions. And the first one is the link length, so-called link length, which is the distance from z and uh, the z-axis of i minus 1 to the z-axis of i, which is shown here. Then I have the link twist, which is the uh, rotation of the z-axis. The, um, um, and you can see that here I have the z-axis, which is going through this link. I moved it over there, so you see how there's an angle between the two. I do have the link offset between uh, the consecutive coordinate systems. In this case, the z-axis is moved up a little. And finally, I have the rotation of the, between the x-axis of x of i minus one and x of i, which I put in here. So uh, this looks more complicated than it actually is. Um, I will give you an example on the next slide. But now the idea is to say, if I can get these numbers by inspection, I get these two translations, and I can infer the two rotations, I can put them into these four standard um, transformation matrices, and then I can multiply them together in this way, and it will get me the transformation from n minus 1 to n. Now, you will see that some of these are familiar. This is the typical joints that we have seen so far. It's a rotation around the z-axis. This is the rotation around the x-axis. This is the translation along x, and this is the translation along z. Now, if you look at an example for the Universal Robots UR5 E-series, you can usually get these parameters from the user manual of the robot. So here you see the two rotations and the two translations, and I can then go and simply populate these matrices. And this has been done here. Uh, this is uh, from GitHub, where somebody has used them to actually compute um, an analytic solution for the not only the forward kinematics, but also the inverse kinematics. Now, what is shown here is just one part uh, of defining one uh, of these uh, links and in this case uh, we populate four of these matrices and then we multiply them together in this way to get the transformation matrix of link i. Now this these kind of uh, representations can also be created directly from the URDF and so you will find a lot of tools like uh, the ikpy library that you can find in Rebots when you open a sample world and put an inverse and the name you will find the world inverse kinematics um, where you have an IBB uh, IRB robot which does the complete inverse kinematics and in this case it computes uh, the equation of a circle that you can see here and then calls the inverse kinematics solver to compute all of the joint positions for the robot to move uh, along this circle. So let's play this again. So you see the circle is drawn, but I really computed these things uh, based on the time step and then feed them into my inverse kinematics solver. Now how does that one work? It actually loads the URDF of this robot from disk. Then you tell it which of all of the joints in the URDF are actually the ones that are active. So the first one is just the base. You can't move. Then I have the six joints of the robot and finally I have the end effector that I cannot change, but that of course is inside the URDF. And then I can simply feed this to this solver and you see already here this max iteration 
uh, parameter suggests that it uses a numerical method, uh, most likely using the differential kinematics that we have been looking at in our previous modules. I'd like to summarize what we talked about today. There's really a spectrum of solutions for the inverse kinematic problem. The easiest thing that you can do for the final project is you can sequence simple learn by demonstration poses that you teach the robot by moving the you know arms or the arm into the right conformation, storing the joint angles and then have the robot move there as you need. But then you can go one level up and start doing inverse kinematics for a reduced system. For example, you just move back and forth or up and down um, by moving the elbow joint. You can then move forward and get complete numerical solutions based on the Danavid Hartenberg scheme um, that gets computed from the URDF and using a library like IKPy. And if you really want, you can even work out the analytical solutions for specific systems up to 7DOF. This is extremely complicated, but it can be done for uh, specific kinematics like the universal robot arm or probably the Tiago robot.